Hi everyone, Maayang Adla. Welcome to the final episode of season three, Abilities Advocacy with Roque Bukton. We are going to examine in this episode how we can be more intentional, thoughtful, and considerate to individuals in our community with varying abilities or disabilities, if you prefer. How can we also learn more about how to advocate for individuals living with disabilities in our workspaces, in our public spaces, and even within our own family and friends network. I hope that you enjoy this episode, another episode that just has opened my mind in just interacting and being more conscientious around those that I love with varying abilities and disabilities. Enjoy. Maayang Adlao, welcome back to Philippine Exit Wildness's final episode of season three. I may sound a little nasally in this episode, y'all. Um, excuse me as I'm fighting some congestion and a cold right now. But as we get into it, I wanted to just say we did it with three seasons. Woohoo! I am your host, Cheryl Sapson Ramirez. Following our last episode on healing racial battle fatigue with Professor Janet Stickman, we will be talking with the Vice Chair of the California State Independent Living Council and Peer Specialist for Painted Brain, Roque Bukton. As mentioned in previous episodes, all views discussed are for informational and educational purposes only. It's not meant to be medical advice. Always consult with your healthcare practitioner for your particular condition, especially before starting any exercise or new health program. For this episode, I'd like to welcome Roque Buktor. Welcome to the podcast, Roque. Hi, everybody. Kulusta. Good to be with you all. Uh, apologies for a little computer fan noise in the background that just kicked on, so we will just have some ambient sounds. <laughs> it's all good. We all could appreciate some white noise and go add, you know, a little bit of uh, ocean soundtrack in the background as we go through the episode. So thank you all for your patience. <laughs> it is a special day. So we usually open our episodes asking where both sides of your family are from and where are you currently streaming from, Roque? Well, um, my family is primarily Bisaya. So there's three Bisaya. Um, I'll start with my mom's side of the family. Um, my mom, by blood, is really Bisaya, but she was raised in Baclaran, Manila, because my grandfather moved the family from Hinonangan, Southern Leyte, to Manila for work, like just prior to the war. Um, and uh, so my my dad is from Hinonangan Leyte. So it's there it's a strong kind of Hinonangan Southern Leyte um connection. Just for a little clarity, there uh beside uh Cibuano, Subuano type variant speaking, the like a dialect of. So they're not Warai, like the northern parts of Leyte. Um I did um have the fortune to be raised by my grandparents. So I, uh, on my maternal grandparents, uh, my grandfather on my uh, mother's side is also from Hinonangan Leyte. Very strong connections there. And my maternal grandmother is from Misamis Occidental. So she also spoke from um, Bisaya. Um, and so I didn't get to meet my uh, my dad's uh, parents, my paternal grandparents, but from best I could tell, they were also from Southern Leyte. So I don't have super detail on that. But um, and then there's connections from my grandfather's oral tra uh, uh, 
transmissions that the his his family came from Bahol a long time ago and they migrated. So there's probably some connection to Bahol as well. Um, so my maternal um, uh, lineage is the Alas side of the family, and then my father's side is Bukto. That's cool. We have a connection. Like my mom's um, family is from Misamis Occidental also, so we're probably related. <laughs> uh, and so as far as where I'm located, I'm here in Tongva lands um, near the, the river in L.A., up in the foothills. So really, um, you know, like a beautiful area, um, really connected to it. And once again, um, um, thankful to be on um, these lands. And that's another fun commonality. I, Folks, I found out that Roque lives up like walking distance from my childhood home. So that's pretty hilarious <laughs> how things like that happen. All right. So now that we know your lineage, let's jump into the topic at hand, ability advocacy. Instead of using the word disability, I wanted to take a strength-based approach to this topic and title it using the word ability. So Roque, tell us about your origin story and what got you on the path towards ability advocacy. Wow. Well, that's a long journey and it starts from birth. So... <clears throat> I was born with a couple of disabilities. Um, one, I was born with a genetic disorder of my eyes, um, and that's called retinitis pigmentosa. And that genetic problem doesn't affect most people till they're much later in adulthood. It's very common. Um, and RP affects the, the uh, periphery of the eye, the retina, so like what most people would think of as their peripheral vision. And over time, those cells don't regenerate. And so you lose like, there's like multiple, I don't know, hundreds, maybe thousands of pixels, so to speak, in in the eye. And the retina, they just don't regenerate. And then you start getting less and less of like field clarity until um, now where I, I just have some light perception, shapes, things like that, I don't have much detail anymore. So it like the onset really affected me probably in my mid thirties. That's when I really started noticing things like um I couldn't see things down at below my like by my feet, by my knees, I would bump into things and you know, and my night vision started going because of course I don't have the same number of um retinal cells. And the other disability I mentioned I was born with I was born with a leg deformity, so my leg is crooked, my right leg. And so that kind of, like when I was a little kid, like when I first started walking from, like when I could see, I saw pictures of me in like these orthopedic shoes. And I was like, hey, look at, I was like, why don't I have these kinds of shoes? And I asked my mom and she said, because you, you had a crooked leg. And she said she would like try to massage my leg to try to straighten it and things like that. Um, so it's affected my hips, of course, because there's like you know balance and length, so to speak, and that goes all, all the way up the spine. And I have like uh, neck, um, in like like imbalances. It's not like a, a perfectly aligned straight spine like some folks have. And um, also had some injuries with my neck. You know, you know, a lot of college and see lot training, and it caught up with me later on in life. Um, the other disability I have is a uh, hearing impairment, which is tinnitus, which is ringing in the ears. And that probably is, it's it's possible and probable, but I did a lot of music playing when I was younger without ear protection. Uh, a lot of rock and roll, punk rock, R&B, jazz bands, and then Kulintang, <laughs> gong music without ear protection. And that is a likely cause, but there may be other reasons, and I'm not sure but I have it as well. So I live with, um, you know, multiple disabilities. So typically I describe myself as a person living with multiple disabilities, hearing impairment, visual impairment, mobility impairment. And um, yeah, that's kind of how, like, my life trajectory has guided me to 
uh, connect to the broader disabilities community. Um, for the longest time, I was working in the Filipino community doing uh, cultural work primarily uh, and traditional lineage practices like the Kulintang and martial arts and studying spiritual practices and just general history um, about the region. And later on in life, I, it was kind of a goal of mine to connect and work in the disability sector. When I first started connecting with the visual impairment uh, community, um, it really did help um, uh, like connect me to the broader visually impaired community and under, have a, uh, having a greater you know understanding of that community. <clears throat> Much later, I wanted to broaden that um, connection to uh, other disabilities. So I started um, connecting um, with other uh, organizations that service a broader uh, range of disabilities, not just um, you know, visual impairment. And that did help me connect to the much larger community that's comprised of so many various disabilities both physical, sensory, and mental. So um, that's how I got uh, uh, really connected into the disability advocacy. Thank you for giving us your origin story and, yeah. and really explaining to us the varying abilities or dis the disabilities that you're living with. So you've been a disability advocate coordinator and peer specialist for Painted Brain since 2021. What is Painted Braid? Let's start with that first. Painted Braid is a peer-run uh, mental health service uh, provider, and they use art as a medium uh, for some of their services. And uh, the peer uh, aspect is important, so it's, it's people that ex uh, describe themselves as having lived experience with mental health challenges. And a lot of uh, the staff identify as having a mental illness. Um, they're very open about uh, sharing and disclosing, things like that. And they do work, you know, with social justice uh, issues. So they, you know, there's things of that nature, the consciousness of the folks. Um, and they have done um, several projects that I've been a part of for the disability sector in particular, uh, for um, uh, mental health support services for people with disabilities. And uh, and currently they're doing a lot of uh, training. So they're doing peer specialist trainings, justice involved trainings, uh, psychiatric advanced directive trainings, and, and that, of course, uh, the disability cultural competency training. And I understand, Roque, that you're certified in uh, as a disability peer specialist, correct? Yeah. Um. So I, 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 um, right around COVID, I decided to uh, get that certification. I took a, a training at an independent living center, and um, so yeah, I'm a disability peer specialist, um, and I have been doing the peer training for um, the medical certification for peer specialist uh, recently. So it's been a really good um, uh, training. It's, you know, it's a, uh, you know, it's primarily the cohorts are comprised of people with lived experience. And I think it's been very interesting as a, a disabled person uh, facilitating trainings like that, because I'm using a screen reader and I'm, trying to like dissolve any kind of mm, mm. like uh, hindrance or obscuration of view regarding people with disabilities, being able to teach and train that, you know, we're competent. We just have a different way of navigating in the world, but the content can be transmitted. So that's been good. That's been really good. For those of us that aren't really knowledgeable you mentioned you use a screen re reader. What is that? So um, most people look at things like on their screen on a computer, for example. I can't see the text or images. So I use um, an application, uh, which is the most common one in the world, which is JAWS. And 
it's it reads the screen and i'll give you a quick demo of what that sounds like so i'm in the recording app that we're using for this podcast i'm just going to okay. tab and you can hear a little bit of how my screen reader functions okay increase size actual recording is higher quality expand frame rock button expand frame button to actual recording is higher quality expand frame cheryl sampson ramirez so it's it's talking about what's on the screen. There's like a frame, I guess, of some kind, and our names are in there, I guess, with some settings and things like that. So I can read documents, websites, um, but there's challenges. There's there's also things that Screen Reader has, like there's like navigation challenges, like Gmail just recently shifted formats, and that just caused like tr trouble trying to navigate in it because the keyboard commands have shifted. So there are challenges. It's it's not perfect you know like there's a learning curve in how to navigate with every app so you I have to figure that out on my phone it's also talking and uh, so my phone talks using a screen reader so there's there's a whole environment of um, the, vis the visually impaired um, navigate in in order to access like common things like uh, smartphones and computers and other other like other platforms um, that you might encounter Thanks for letting us experience that example. I don't think many people who are not in, in your community are aware of all the different tools that you might utilize throughout the day. So let's go back to, again, talking about your Disability Peers Special Certificate. Tell us more about what that entails now that you have that certificate. Well, it basically just, um, you know, covers most of the, the, the basic support services that you might provide as a mental health service provider um, with a particular emphasis on the disabilities community. So it's not uh, like a, a licensed clinical social worker, MSW or something like that. It's like one step down. It's it, like below that, you could say. But it's getting very popular amongst uh, uh, mental health service providers because the the clients themselves, the people themselves, they really do like connecting to someone with lived experience, meaning someone who has like um, a parallel life path that can relate to them without that client or peer, that person having to explain it all. And in particular, uh, like with people with disabilities, like if I was with a clinician who was able-bodied and doesn't understand living with multiple disabilities, it's kind of hard to, you know, transmit what that all means. And in particular, like I know there's um, some friends and colleagues who are deaf, hard of hearing, and they find it difficult to connect with the uh, uh, clinician, therapist, who doesn't have the lived experience of being hard of hearing or deaf, and they, they you know, like they might not know how to sign, and they have to go through an interpreter, etc. So... Those are sort of the things that, um, in particular, the you know disability peer specialist um, certification covers, so that you understand like how to speak, you know, from a trauma informed you know position. You understand cultural humility and cultural competence. You understand um, the various um, like uh, approaches to. Um, dealing with particular, like, disabilities, you know, so there's a range of, like, uh, uh, like speech impairments that, you know, you'd have, you learn to navigate, intersectionalities in particular, like how people have multiple, can have multiple disabilities, they can have a physical and a mental disability, um, and how they have to navigate in the world, so all these challenges, like, if I'm dealing with people who are blind, we totally understand, like, how a screen reader is not is not incompatible with certain apps, and it's frustrating to navigate. You can't you can't accomplish things. Or uh, in the past, you know, like the people would send you a, a flyer or something, and it's just all an image, and you're like, what's in this? What's the date? What's your <laughs> etc. There's some workarounds for all that now. I mean, and AI is definitely helping out with those sorts of things. Awesome. 
I mean, I feel like it's funny that you were talking about cultural competency in a different way because I feel like your screen reader needs to be cultural competent in re- pronouncing your name right. <laughs> That's also a thing too. Yeah, you get used to your my name like Rock, like it says yeah. Rock. It pronounces my name Rock, or uh, I've heard it. You know, like Row Q. Like, uh, yes, you're seated here in aisle nine, Row Q. Um, uh, like things like that. It, it's 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 on some level sometimes it's fun, but on other times it it, it is kind of difficult to um, hear things correctly because the screen reader. You know, th- I think it's just amazing. I would not be able to interface in this modern world without these assistive technologies. So, yes, there are roadblocks for sure, um, but all there's been so much improvement over time. I mean, I didn't have any of this stuff back in the past. You know, there there was. We like way back when there, there was very few devices to help um, people with disabilities. So it's it's grown quite a bit. I'm glad that you went also over like what a peer specialist certificate entails because I'm sure that we have other mental health providers uh, listening to this podcast. So it's good for them to also be aware of that certification. You know, if they also want to work with. Um, like population with like varying dis- abilities and disabilities. So thank you for ex- going into and explaining what that entails. Let's transition in talking about your role as a council member for the California State Independent Living Council. So why don't you maybe explain to us first, what is the California State Independent Living Council and wh- what do they do? Well, the State Independent Living Council of California is sort of the oversight uh, body that um, um, looks over the various budgets and um, capacities and infrastructure for of services for people with disabilities. And um, primarily, th- their those services are um, uh, provided through the independent living centers in California. So there's about 28 independent living centers for people with disabilities scattered throughout the state of California. Here in Los Angeles, there are about uh, five or six um, centers just because LA County is so big. Um, there's like a need for like a lot of capacity. And so the council, the SIL for short, um, goes over uh, like federal funding uh, for these uh, centers and uh, like how that's um, um, how like that budget is uh, uh, built out like various components various little you know pockets of money for this or that and then it also looks at um, how the larger departments are providing services for um, disabled people in California so the uh, Department of Rehabilitation, um, they play a, a significant role in providing services for uh, disabled people. Uh, for folks with mental illnesses, the uh, develop, uh, Department of Developmental Services uh, provides services, and particularly they uh, provide services via the regional centers uh, throughout the uh, state. And then also aging, as a lot of uh, us know that when you age, you can often uh, ha- end up having a disability, age-related. Um, various uh, things can uh, turn into disabilities as you age. So the um, the Department of Aging also has a lot to uh, uh, contribute to services for uh, people with disability, living with disabilities. And then there's all other different agencies, long-term um, support services, in-home support services, etc. You know, like helping people uh, uh, be able to live independently in their homes or, and their community. Um, so that's that. Yeah, the, that's a good overview. And you know, the council is uh, comprised of a mixture of people with uh, lived experience and uh, center directors. So that that's that's basically the silk. And what are some of the items that you're focusing on uh, and advocating for currently? Um, I would say right now it's like long-term supportive services to make sure that um, there's access for people who have like um, uh, conditions that uh, are 
probably not going to alter over time, that, uh, that they're able to have services across their lifespan. Um, so like, let's say a youth going to school, things like that, you know, like, so from education and then as they transition to like, um, uh, college age, if they're able to access college in one way or another, maybe even remote learning programs, and then adulthood to get work, et cetera. And then, um, in their, like, if they need in-home supportive services, that they're getting those kind of community-based services. Mm, that's like, that's one thing. Well, just to, you know, like have some uh, awareness, like budget wise, we're always like trying to make sure that, um, programs are, are, uh, people know of these various programs that the organizations, the, uh, the community-based organizations know of the funding opportunities. So there's a lot of incentives to, um, uh, promote different kinds of, uh, either grants or bids of contract. Mm. Also, um, the, uh, like voter, uh, registration and actual voting. That's like a, a thing to help, you know, people have awareness to, that who are disabled, that the voting is accessible. We track a lot of bills um, and uh, going through the legislature. So there's a big emphasis on keeping track of bills that impact the community. Um, for, and that can be to varying degrees. It could be um, uh, like a budget allocations or new projects and programs. Um, there could be um, very local support things like, you know, for a specific county, things like that, transportation, um, all those sorts of things. So it's all kind of interconnected, whatever people with disabilities interface with, um, there's more than likely going to be something that we're staying on top of. Um, we, we are, we, the self focuses on advocacy. So it, it's, it's more of, um, speaking about particular issues highlighting something and it's not um lobbying so we're not you know asking uh, uh the legislature directly for funds but we're saying we what we can do is say this there's an issue uh you know and that they should pay attention i'll, I'll give you one of my pet ones this is not a silk one this is just something i've it's that has come to my knowledge and uh, um, maybe it'll get some traction with the council but about 50% of the homeless in uh, Los Angeles, and I think this is a California statistic as well, it's about 47%, about half the people who are unhoused uh, describe themselves, identify uh, as a person living with a disability. And to me, that kind of makes it a disabilities issue. Uh, and, you know, so it adds another layer to the complexity of the unhoused. And so um, I'm hoping that um, in the upcoming round of legislature legislature visits, uh, we'll be meeting um, with some of the representatives and senators that um, I can maybe get some attention about this being a disabilities issue as well, uh, uh, you know, along with the many other complexities of the unhoused. Yeah, no, for sure. That's definitely a current thing that um, is on the minds of, of many people, especially if you're living in the Los Angeles area, right? So, you know, Roque, um, for me personally or professionally, I, as a social worker working within the K-12 through public education realm, I've always been baffled on how one teacher could provide varying or differentiated instruction to a classroom of students with varying abilities or, or disabilities, as you like to also term it. So I'm also curious, with various types of disabilities out there, how do you determine what to prioritize within your advocacy work? That's a really good question. Um, there is a great amount of diversity of need. So, um, what to prioritize is can be challenging. Um, different different disability sectors definitely have like an emphasis of you know their needs. For example, uh, people um, who have mobility impairments that um, require in-home supportive services that 
that's a real serious driver um, for support. And, uh, there's a lot of people with uh, mobility and visual impairments where transportation is a major challenge. So, for example, in Los Angeles, um, there's a pretty robust transportation system, and they have what's called paratransit. Yeah. And in rural areas, they don't have those services. It's and it's it, it that or the reason that is uh, why rural communities don't have the same um, uh, paratransit services is because of the way the Americans with Disabilities Act stipulates the um, um, the service rate uh, like map like um, it it reads like this I'll I'll paraphrase um, uh, like they'll provide paratransit service. Uh, within three quarters of a mile of a fixed uh, bus route or train line. So if you're outside of that three quarter of a mile distance, you're outside of the service range, according to the Americans with Disabilities Act. That might need to be, you know, redefined. Yeah. Looked at it because there's plenty of people that live outside that right. that range who are disabled. You know, there's a lot of people. It's limiting. In, rural areas and that you know there's I, I'm, I'm in the past there was not the same kind of um let's say um like fair uh ge ge geographic spread of where people are living you know now there's mm -hmm. people living all over the place in rural areas and even just they, and there's even some communities that are like you know, somewhat urban, but they don't have the infrastructure. So th that's a challenge. There's so many things I could just go on and on, you know, like there's things related to drugs that, um, you know, like um, uh, folks are advocating for certain kind of medications, etc. cetera. Um, any number of like um, things pop up and that's where the advocacy takes place. You know, you, you get uh, feedback from the community. Like this is, this is the thing that's affecting us that, you know, you don't even realize it. Um, until it, 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 you know, um, the community explains it to you, uh, and then you, then you understand the dynamics. So there's things like, um, issues about, um, the current, uh, care core, you know, and how, how is that going to affect people with mental illness? Uh, are they going to have, uh, just, uh, like, are there, are their rights going to be, uh, preserved? You know, are they going to be forced into facilities, et cetera? There's all kinds of dynamics like that that are, are challenging. Um, yeah, so um, along with that, I'll just share that also um, I do sit on another council, which is the uh, Protection Advocacy Council. Uh, the full name is the Protection and Adv Advocacy for Individuals with Mental Illness. That's a, a SAMHSA, what is that? A Substance Abuse Mental Health Service Administration Federal Oversight Committee. And that's for people with severe mental illness. So those folks that have been identified as, as having a severe mental illness, those that might be in a uh, guardianship, uh, conservatorship, trust, et cetera, those in those, um, let's say, uh, uh, facilities um, that they're, they, you know, they live in. Um, uh, some locked facilities, um, the prisons, uh, any place that uh, someone who identifies with a severe mental illness, um, that committee looks at, let's say, any kind of complaints that arise in these various facilities or these or, or these um, people who identify as such, uh, like write and um, post complaints. So they look at those things and they can go from you know, the cases could be as simple as just uh, trying to, you know, put a, a, a set of best practices in into play at a facility so that, like, the staff is more skilled in the way they're handling uh, the the people. And or if it's really a b egregious thing and someone was really violated, then it goes into a, a, uh, a case. You know, there's actual uh, charges and things can escalate from very small, you know, courts all the way up to the Supreme Court. So it it it's a range of protections, as in the name. 
to make sure that these this vulnerable population is uh, uh, tended to uh, uh, fairly and well and not abused in particular. Such important work, you know, that you're doing for your community, Roque. Um, it's, it was great to start this first half and getting a, a bit of a background on what you do and your advocacy work along with your origin story. Um, thank you for joining us all for our 12th and final episode of Season 3. I'm talking with the Council Vice Chair of the California State Independent Living Council, a peer specialist for Painted Brain, Roque Bukton. Feel free to take a quick stretch, refill your water or tea. We'll be right back with a fun second half after this quick break. You were just listening to the Instinctual Tra Time Travels by Jinji, released in 2011 off of her Jinji album through 623537 Records, DK. Jinji is a DJ, producer, percussionist, and vocalist. You can find her music on all digital platforms, and we'd like to thank Jinji for consent to use her track in this episode. Shout out to all our Philippine ex artists and musicians out there laying down the tracks. And I just wanted to thank all of the artists and musicians out there that have given us consent to use your tracks on this, on our podcast. This is actually the last episode for a while that we'll be breaking up our episodes into halves with um, our musicians from our community. So I just wanted to do, to do a special, special quick thank you for an acknowledgement of appreciation for all of you that have lent us consent to play your music. Returning from our break, I'm talking with Roque Bukton about ability advocacy. Now, Roque, we are a Philippine ex-Filipino podcast, so given the needs of our Filipino and Philippine ex community, let's start with what do you feel are our priorities around ability advocacy? Where should we begin? Well, you know, um, I think one of the biggest challenges that exists within the Filipino community is the shame or stigma associated with someone that has a disability. And that could be the individual themselves having shame about, what, you know, what their condition and the family in particular having shame about like a child that has a particular disability. I think that's one of the biggest things is to overcome the stigma uh, within a family, to um, encourage them to be more open about it and support in, in a more like transparent way and not to feel um, shame. Because there's it's just a condition, you know, many people have disabilities and as people age, they can have uh, you know, disabilities uh, occur, even though they've been healthy most of their life. So it's, you could say it's a, a, a natural occurrence on many levels. There are extraordinary conditions, of course. But I'd say the biggest one is that, you know, like uh, people fe 
feeling, you know, for various reasons, shame, um, whether that's social or, you know, like, or, you know, like in our Filipino community, there's a lot of superstition as well, uh, connected to religious practices. Also, there can be like some, you know, superstitions related to that. And to kind of free those kinds of projections would be very helpful. Um, and then also try to acknowledge the, um, the, let's say the, the load that the individual carries, you know, like the emotional uh, challenge and also the family's emotional uh, uh, load, meaning it's a lot to take on when people, someone has a disability individually and within a family and to develop those kinds of support services would be really good um, so that the, the person with a disability and their uh, family and primary caregivers um, have some kinds of supports. I don't really see those sorts of things happening in the community. Um, and I think that would be really uh, great. I didn't receive those kinds of things. And I know that um, I myself would have benefited uh, from them. And my family, my mom in particular, would have benefited from those kinds of supports because I know it was a load upon her to hear that her child is going to go blind, you know, um, things like that. So, um, yeah. Are you, when you say like supports um, for the individual with, with a disability and also for the family members or the loved ones, are you are you talking about like therapeutic support or even also how to navigate the system? I would say I would say primarily mental health support services like support groups um, of different kinds so that uh, people would have a better mental state to deal with the challenge. Um, both as the individual and with the family and their caregiving, because there's various kinds of disabilities that require different kinds of levels of effort and capacities. But yes, um, understanding like uh, like what sort of support services are out there, like that you know those kinds of like that kind of a network is available to the community that people can go to and say yes, you know I've I've become disabled or I would, I, you know, I'm disabled from birth or et cetera, or the family, you know, there's something, um, where they're having to provide support services and they need, you know, to like, um, uh, find services in their area. Like if those sorts of things are in place, those it be beneficial in general. Um, sometimes just having a uh, community support in a given language could be very important. So those sorts of things, you know, are what I would recommend. Yeah, I was thinking about that, too. As you were speaking, I was thinking about also being able to provide that even in different dialects, especially since we're, um, you know, have so many dialects in the Philippines would be really helpful to just have, right, for folks. Sure. Um, yeah, it, it does help to, um, you know, speak about things in your primary language. There's, there's, you know, emotional things that you can express much better. Um, and there's a comfort and an ease of being able to communicate. So having a, like a primary language support service is, is, would be very beneficial. So, um, Roki, personally, how did your family navigate around your disability? Well, I know it was tough for my mom, um, because she didn't really understand because like I had mentioned earlier, retinitis pigmentosa is a genetic disorder and then its onset is gradual over many years. So it's a course of time where your eyesight diminishes. So it was hard for my mom to understand. Like, what's, what do you mean my son's going blind? He, he's functional. He wears glasses, but he's getting around. He does all kinds of things, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And so that was really tough, you know, you know, for her to grasp. The family was wondering what's going on. Like, what do you mean? You know, like, uh, maybe there was something that caused it or, you know, like, whatever, some other reasons. Um, and, you know, trying to understand what, how to navigate all that was not easy for my mom. She was trying to get services, trying to help me out, but um, it was tough to navigate for sure. And I'm sure it was, you know, emotionally challenging, you know, uh, um, and for the family, they don't know 
you know, they don't have the skill sets. They're they they're not equipped like that. You know, they're not licensed clinicians or things like that. So, you know, they're they're coming from it from a different you know viewpoint. Um, just kind of general support. They don't. They also don't under, didn't understand what my disability was. You know, like because I had such high function. Um, uh, so yeah, that I it was difficult for sure. Uh, uh in, yeah emotionally for me as well it was very challenging you know um the like i did not have the emotional like uh skills of language to express you know what i was going through at that time it's somewhat overwhelming when you're like in the midst of it all um much later i developed those skills because i became more at ease with my disability had a greater level of understanding of it and the like the potential that I had as a human being uh, and not being um um let's say like uh, like thinking that my life was over because I had a visual impairment and as your uh, visual impairment progressed and you got begun began to understand more about what it entailed. How did you help your family members navigate around your needs and and help them to understand what support you needed? Well, one th- I you know, I I I just by my actions, um, they saw that I was uh in, you know, independent, that I was engaged in the community, doing community work. Uh, a lot of cultural things, um, and that uh, I was, you know, getting through life, basically, that, you know, um, I was able to, you know, do certain things, go to school, work, do culture projects, etc. cetera. Um, and also um, them having more experience around me, so them understanding, like, how to guide me around, you know, so they got comfortable with that. You know, it, there's certain things like um, uh, that goes to the like cultural competencies, you know, like how to approach someone, you know, who's blind, you know, how to guide them instead of them grabbing me and pulling me or things like that. And then um, also them understanding that I I do have like abilities, like I, I can navigate in a space, a given space that, you know, I can manage myself you know, uh, doing different things and then letting them know where I really do need help. Like, uh, like, please help me read this mail, for example, back in the day before all that screen reader things and all that. Um, uh, we, we didn't have those sorts of things. We didn't have like devices, like we didn't have cell phones. So we didn't, I didn't have any, you know, that high tech stuff that we have now built in the phone that, you know, that where it could read text and things like that, or scenes or colors or identify currency, all those sorts of things I needed help with in the past. So, yeah, I think just just getting, uh, it, having that time to for my family to get comfortable with how I move in the world, I think is one of those things. Like you know, they they understand how to guide me, you know, orient, you know, help with certain things or orienting, etc. Um, but yeah, the. That that's that's the the real life experience, the engagement um, with the family. That's where it really happens, and sharing, you know, on my side, like how best to help me. Hmm. We have other uh, mental health providers that are either watching or listening in, and you mentioned as your disability progressed um, that you also would have benefited from em- emotional and mental support in the process of it, right? So tell us more about what that emotional and mental support could look like for someone who is either a mental health provider or for someone who has a loved one that is either born with a disability or develops it in a later onset as yourself. Sure, yeah. Uh, So this was uh, kind of an informal support network so I went to um, service centers where there were a lot of blind folks, you know, and I was going through a difficult time because, of course, I was losing my sight in this sort of transitional phase. Um, and I encountered, like, 
a lot of blind folks, visually impaired folks, that were doing well. They weren't just sad and depressed. They were happy. They were joking around. They were active. They, you know, they, they taught at the centers. They worked at the centers. They had other jobs. They had careers. A lot of folks were, you know, entrepreneurial. Uh, this, you know, and it, it changed my perspective. So it was sort of like an informal, informal peer support network or group. You know, I started hanging out with folks, doing kinds of projects, assisting, um, and just all the interaction. And so that that kind of like peer support is good. Like a you know peer support group if someone's a clinician, if they're you know are able to facilitate that kind of thing for the community, um, you know, that would be of great benefit. Um, those clinicians that have a disability, you know, if they can highlight that they have that kind of lived experience and can support in particular sectors, you know, um, that would be of great benefit as well. Um, just going through some like um, general trainings, uh, just to, to to share what I mentioned earlier, I was uh, uh, part of the team. We developed a disability cultural competency training, um, and that was to help clinicians um, to understand the various nuances of providing service to uh, the disabilities community. So um, things like that would be of great benefit um, so that... Uh, the clinicians would understand various, you know, like basic needs, um, uh, you know, like uh, how to address someone for the first time, how to interact with them, you know, uh, very basic, like simple protocols like that, sort of uh, sets of best practices of how to um, facilitate um, like either uh, therapy sessions or group sessions, Um those would be all of great benefit to the community, plus the layer of like uh, Filipino culture competencies. So you know, like the the way people want to interact. You know, there's all kinds of uh, cultural things where people want to talk about you know their life a little bit first. You know, they talk story a little bit before they can settle in. There might be like food things, you know, which is a big <laughs> community. There might be like those group sessions might have to have that as part of um, the thing, um, etc. You name it, like those those sorts of Philip, actual Filipino cultural um, uh, competencies, that, you know, uh, blended together um, uh, could could really benefit the community. And for those that are tuning in, right, from all over the diaspora, because we've checked our data and we find that there's also people that are listening and watching from other countries. If they, if they discover that they have a loved one that was born with a disability or has a later onset, as with your own story, where do they begin to s obtain support from the very beginning? What do you recommend as a starting point when you want to obtain support for your loved one? It depends. You know, internationally, it's, it varies over, like, every country. You know, uh, America has a very developed um, service, you know, um, network, and that comes from the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is rooted in the civil rights movement. So it comes out of that, you know, it's it's definitely connected to those movements. So the movements for um, um, equal rights, voting rights, uh, uh, civil rights, yeah, civil rights, all the, the and that, you know, the, the, the a lot of the like um, uh, pioneers of the, I don't know if that's the right word, but the advocates of the independent movement are connected to that. They come out of that same kind of uh, like grassroots um, advocacy, and they fought really hard to get, I you know, their services. So, th so that so that's the, the the genesis of the Americans with Disabilities Act. In Europe, there's a pretty developed, you know, um, uh, legal structure for people to get, uh, you know, reasonable accommodations and services, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, then again, internationally, it varies depending on where you are. But, you know, always go to, like, the very specific organizations that are dealing with that disability 
that that's always a good uh, go to. If there are any kind of community based organizations, for example, like here in the United States, we have the independent living centers, and that's national. So there's always going to be like a center dedicated to serving a broad spectrum of people with disabilities. It's not just specific, so that's that's really good as a as a go to because they 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 will pretty much like uh, assist with any kind of disability. Um, there's there's certain specific niches that have sp- certain paths, like if it's a mental illness, for example. Uh, then there's like service centers for those. Um, also, just connecting with the actual people that have the specific disability. So if there's like a a network of, of folks like that, going right to them, they're usually very knowledgeable themselves about what kind of services are available. You know, they'll they'll kind of know the organizations, they'll kind of know what kind of services, you know, that you can apply for. Um, and so I would say that, you know, uh, in general, it, those are uh, good places to start. Um, and for organizations, let's say nonprofits or private companies that would like to open up access for individuals with varying abilities, let's just say they're launching from the, you know, from the start, right? Where can they, where can they start to begin to create, open up access and create access? Well, uh, fundamentally, it would in the United States, it would be the Americans with Disabilities Act, which covers, uh, uh, like the various um, um, compliances that you have to have in order to provide services for someone with a disability. So from the physical location itself, like a facility, a building, a school, a community center, for example, um, a church, temples, etc., like how to make them more accessible physically, um, and also in terms of navigation and orientation. And then there's work, you know, um, accessibilities, that uh, uh, that you know, reasonable accommodations can be provided for someone with a disability in order to work, and that's their right to be accommodated. In school, in particular, um, it's really grown for education. Back in the day, I didn't have those sorts of uh, you know support services, and it was much more challenging. Now, education has really progressed. So, the, you know, understanding like the support services that a student. Um, uh, is eligible for the, the, those those sorts of things. Beyond that, I would say um, really talking to the to the person with a disability and asking what their needs are. That's because many things are affecting the the com- our community, the disabled community, that you know are unique to a given uh, uh, place, a particular you know situation. Um, a particular obstacle uh, that, you know, so I always defer to like speak to the person, ask them, you know, like what sort of services they need and then kind of work in combination with the requirements. So there's like compliance, but there's also just like what's really working because there's a lot of things. Um, I'll say that there's a big difference between ADA compliance, meeting the federal like requirements and no. cultural competencies. Mm. So those that's the other side of it. I'd say it, if you have a balance between those two things, you'll be doing really well. And when you say um, ADA compliance versus cultural competencies, are you when you say cultural competency, are you, because I think we've used it, it varied um, in terms of definition throughout the episode. Are you talking about cultural competency related to a particular um a disability, or are you talking about cultural competency also based on one's ethnic background? Let's well, say. in this case, I'm referring to etiquette more when I say cultural competency. So, you know, a, pro, a you know proper etiquette in in inter, interacting with someone with a disability. Got it. In rather than like thinking, oh, this person is blind, so he needs everything in braille. Well, right. Not necessarily because that might be a little slower for that person to to use. You know, yeah. it's way faster to use my screen reader than reading, you know, like documents and printed Braille. Because nowadays they have Braille displays. So it's not even common to get a, a printed Braille. It's it's more common for someone to plug in a Braille display, which has the grid of the dots on a display. The, the, the dots pop up 
per line and you're navigating like a website or something wow. like that. And then you're just touching the, the dot matrix kind of line by line, you know, how, how, however you got your, your display set up and they're moved they're they're So that's Braille or they're, they're, you know, like they might be reading in private because, you know, like with my screen reader or my phone talking and he would yeah. hear it. So if you want some privacy, you might be, you know, reading or composing something, a transmission in with your Braille display, et cetera. So that's, that's a real big difference. You know, that's happened to me. You know, I've experienced that where people wanted to help, you know, different agencies and they're like, oh, well, there's a, you know, a blind person participating. So we have to get everything printed in Braille. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa pause. No, 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 you, you could have asked me first. And then, you know, that's, uh, that's cultural competency etiquette that you ask the person like, hey, what's the best way we can get you this material? Then they can share like, oh, you know, I just prefer in an accessible doc format. And I can, I can get that either from my laptop or my phone. It'll, it, the screen reader can read it, you know? So that, that's a simple example, but that happens across multiple disabilities. You know, what's best, you know, like, yeah. um, uh, like, uh, interpreters, like, you know, like, like the best way to interface with someone who's, you know, using sign language, et cetera. Yeah. I'm glad that you clarified what you meant by cultural competency and, and I could even just circling back to what we were talking about in terms of how can um, we, you know, advocate more in our uh, Filipino or Filipinx community, you mentioned shame, right? And sometimes shame or hia is like a big barrier uh, um, in our community. Even maybe someone might feel embarrassed to ask, you know, an individual with this, with a disability what their needs are. So it's having to really just overcome that initial shame or embarrassment to just really start where the individual is at. So, yeah, I actually got excited though, Roque, when you were talking about these other technological developments and advances. You mentioned even like as a child, where we are now te technologically is, is such a different place, right? I mean, right now, the, one of the current topics that comes to mind that you mentioned earlier is AI, artificial intelligence. So you alluded to that earlier. Um, where do you see artificial intelligence intersecting with individuals with varying abilities or disabilities? There are tremendous applications and uh, growth in that area to help um, folks with disabilities. Uh, and just to begin... You know, like there are concerns about AI and, you know, becoming, you know, completely sentient and then taking over. But it, right. it's appropriate use, you know, like um, of the tool, you know, any any tool, it's it's up to the, you know, users how that, you know, you know, like ultimately what happens. Totally. So, you know, like uh, for the vision impaired, I'll just start there. There's. There's all kinds of AI apps that help read things, you know, like text and stuff like that. But it goes beyond that. It could read currency, colors. It can identify colors, but it can also identify people. So if you like aim your camera and you have like a, like a, like a, let's say on your photos and you have things named, they could identify as like, oh, that's Cheryl, you know, you know, like, cause I'll put it like Cheryl picture, whatever. And then yeah. like if it, the AI, you know, sees you, you holding my phone. It could say that's Cheryl in the room, you know, so you could actually have it in the room. Oh, wow. Maybe. Yeah. So it can do more than that. It it can do like, it, it's really developing. So like it can tell me like real time, let's say I'm at a conference. It can identify things. It, it will speak things like there's a, a, a speaker at the podium gesturing like this. There's a, like a, a it seems like there's a screen with text behind that, that person, et cetera. So, you know, if like there's like a, you know, like a kind of a PowerPoint, you know, going on. And then it can also talk about in real time, the people in the audience reacting, all oh, people are raising their hands, people responding, laughing, smiling, etc. cetera. Uh, it could talk about the decor in the room, the layout, you know what I mean? All those yeah. kinds of things. It can do scenes in the, in the street. It can, it can tell you you're in a landscape, your environment, you're in a park, you're in a street, urban situation, you're in a parking lot. It does all that stuff. It's pretty profound. And just in common, everyday things, it like if I someone sends me a picture, the AI will 
describe the picture. They'll say, woman seated in a chair, smiling, wearing something. You know what I mean? Like, I'm like, I, that, yeah. I never get that detail before in the past. For other folks like who are speech impaired, um, like with severe speech impairments, the AI is starting to learn their speech pattern and can translate. Before in the past, it had to be someone who was very familiar with that person and they had an individual translator because you have to be so attuned to how they speak in order to translate for them. But the AI is, is standing in there. There's a, another app where, a couple of apps actually, where it's able to interpret sign language. So a deaf person can sign to a phone or a camera, like let's say on a laptop, and the AI will interpret the sign language and turn it into text. And in my case, it would speak it. So it'd be turned to text into speech. So you're able to, I, you know, it, you know, interface. So there's tremendous growth and, you know, like um, in the, in these areas. So I think of it as like just a, a, a good tool um, and it's, it's ever developing. There's just so many more layers that are, are just, surprising at, at what its capacities are you know all those things i mentioned i mean years ago what i had to look for a pay phone on the street you know what i mean to call <laughs> my paratransit i mean me yeah they've trying to find a pay phone on the street in la in order to call and say hey i like call my provider and be like i think i'm on this corner i have no idea because i didn't have gps that talked <laughs> then you know yeah so, yeah, come a long way. It's good to kind of also hear that balance and how AI can can be helpful, right? Because I think oftentimes when we hear a discussion around it, it comes from a fear-provoking place. So it's also good to really hear how it uh, may help, like, individuals living with disabilities and the various ways that it comes through. You're, I mean, especially co by providing context and a, a social cues that's like super important right with wow yeah with various like communities like um that have varying like abilities even i just thought of that that's really you know that's something that happens to me like uh, I'll, I'll give you an example like i meet someone they're sticking their hand out but i have no idea right I shake my hand you know what i mean so it seems like i'm being rude or something like that but i did i just didn't know but if I yeah. have my phone out and AI is running, it might say, oh, the person is reaching out their right hand toward, you know, towards you. And I'll be like, oh, they want to shake hands, you know, something like that. Because some people don't have that kind of like verbal skill to say something like that. Like, you know, like, hey, do you shake hands? I'm sticking my hand out. You know, some people are very familiar with uh, the blind just say phrases like that, you know, naturally. But unless you know to say that it might not be you might not I might not know you know any blind person might not be able to like pick that up no totally and that's like the cultural competency piece that you were speaking about earlier I mean even we did an episode um you know talking also about supporting neurodivergent individuals I mean I can only imagine too how AI can also be helpful um to explain tone right for maybe um um individuals you know that are like um you know that are neurodivergent to to pick up on the intent or the tone behind what someone's saying so that's pretty incredible to kind of hear the direction of where we're going as technology further develops so roke we are a wellness podcast and we typically like to also ask our guests what their wellness routines on self care practices consist of and just by knowing you i know that you're well established in this realm so i mean let you know we we know that so uh what do you do for your own wellness and self-care outside of advocacy share that with our community i'm sure um well um many years ago as i was starting to lose my sight you know i i you know, was depressed. It was very challenging, you know, and, and my, my lifestyle just wasn't like the best. And I really started doing, you know, making a, a transformation uh, in my personal life. And one of the things I started doing was an annual cleanse. 
So have what, and I'll describe this in more detail. Like every year from the Lunar New Year to the vernal equinox uh, for stay of spring, I go through as holistic as I can uh, a cleanse, and and that entails like just basic diet things. But as it has evolved, um, it's now moved to like organ cleanses. Um, so things like cleaning the uh, kidneys, go doing kidney flush, liver gallbladder flush, colon cleanses, um, uh, like heavy metal uh, detoxes, different kinds of detoxes, you know, to, to help the blood in particular, um, cleaning the blood, um, doing those kinds of practices. And it's, you know, it. Uh, I've had many, many kinds of like, spiritual practices that I've uh, practiced for uh, for many years. So uh, uh, meditation practices in particular. So things that were connected to Sri Visaya, that all that big lineage of uh, Buddhist Vajrayana Tantra, um, those sorts of practices have been really meaningful to me. Um, uh, you know, like what most people uh, describe as yoga is a, like specifically movement yogas, but most of the yogas are like more meditation related. Uh, like most, like 90% of, of yoga is like meditation practice, uh, spiritual practice. Um, that's, that's what, I, that's some of that, you know, like absorptions, um, you know, really studying, um, like, uh, I, I like studying with like the, the, the history of our spiritual practices, you know, so things that the tribes practice, I try to integrate into my life. Mm. Years ago, when I first started, part of that spiritual cleanse and um, journey, like I mentioned, is absorptions. And um, part of that is learning uh, the actual lineages. So like uh, studying Kulintang Gong music, that was very important to me. I'm a musician. So part of my wellness is to play music. Um, well, uh, right now, I've just like during COVID, you know how there was a lockdown, so we were kind of stuck, and it, there wasn't a lot of stuff going on, or it was very restricted. I just wanted to pick up a uh, an absorption, a practice, a study, and I picked up guitar um, as my choice. So I've been like shedding guitar and all that, and that's been really great because it's very there's a very kind of um, completeness to that. It it it's music. But it requires like you know a, a, a practice, like the actual practicing regularly every day, and then rocky out again. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, doing you know like regular you know um, you know study. You know, there's like the intellectual side, the harmony and theory of stuff like that. Um, and so the other things like um, uh that I do for, you know, like the wellness would be like exercise, movement things. So like movement yoga, as I mentioned earlier, things like just physical things, you know, whatever kinds of exercises um, and doing all those things holistically. So also um, part of that is uh, like detoxing is, um, you know, like you're, you're, like I mentioned earlier, you're detoxing the body, but also like things that you describe as toxic. So I do things like at this time, like not listen to the news which is such a refreshing thing to do for like a month and a couple of months. It depends on the cycles duration, but yeah. that has a profound impact on your well-being. Not listening to the news, kind of reducing social media as much as possible because there are things that just happen because of work, um, mm -hmm. and just trying to be more mindful about things. You know, to, you know, uh, uh, allowing for like uh, an expanse of. You know, like just to be at peace without any kind of distractions, no podcast playing, no disrespect there, but you know, not <laughs> listen to not take eggs, radio, you know, um, you know, TV for some, uh, it could be good. Uh, certain spaces I might not be going to or activities just because it's too much activity at a given time. Yeah. And going to other things. So, like going to meditations or like talks or things like that, like that are, um, uh, 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 you know, that assist in, in, in that. So, I, you know, it's evolved over time. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I really think it's, uh, helped me, uh, in my wellness journey. Uh, and, uh, I, I rely upon it. This would be my 35th year of doing it. So I've done it consistently, consistently for 35 years now. No, and that, that really 
it's it I have reflected on that duration and how it's transformed over time and how much easier it is for me to do it. Before it was a challenge because of lifestyle. Now I'm I live most of the time like this. So it's not so dramatic a shift, you know. So most yeah. of my life looks like a cleansing for the average person or like a like a the spiritual you know like practitioner um but I, I live like that most of the time so it's not so dramatic a shift it's much more natural i would say the thing that uh is of emphasis would be like the uh internal organ cleanses that would be something i don't do on a regular basis so quieting the body quieting the mind a lot of meditation practice for sure yeah various kinds there's many lineages that i practice and so those are throughout the day um, um happen and yeah the, it it's of great benefit you know holistically um and um I, I, it has really uh transformed my life over time awesome now Roque, as we begin to close how can our community find you if they have additional questions well, I'm not the most active on social media. Um, however, I do have an Instagram account. So you can reach me at roque.ab uh, on Instagram and hit me up on a DM and I'll try to navigate and get to you. Um, I'll be more mindful about popping in there more frequently. Uh, I know my friends, uh, you know, post on there and I, you know, community folks post on there uh, and Yes, please uh, feel free to reach out. And if you're in the community, I'm really approachable. I'm always open to, you know, you know networking, connecting with folks. Um, so, like, community events, please feel free to reach out. Okay. Final words, is there anything else that you would want our community throughout the diaspora to know when it comes to supporting individuals living with varying abilities? Well, one that uh, a person living with a disability is can be like a really whole person. Like it just, it, they just have a different way of interfacing in the world. It's sort of, I always think of it kind of like animals. Animals have their own kind of unique way. You know, they have a range of capacities and limitations. Um, and it's like that. It's like this, like, like I'm um, just my own sort of being, just like an animal has their way of being, you know, and, um, uh, also that, you know, uh, that we're not, uh, like, you know, hazardous to your health, that <laughs> you can come up to us, talk to us, interact with us, you know, connect, you know, we're just human beings, um, just like anyone else. And on some level, like, just because you can see my disability, uh, it doesn't mean that, you know, like you don't have your own struggles as well that are can be as challenging as mine or even more. So just because you're an able-bodied person. So we can connect as just human beings in the journey to, you know, deal with our various ways of navigating uh, and being, you know, well together. So I would say um, just connect to uh, to people with, you know, disabilities as you would anybody else. You know, I mean, you go up to dogs and just pet on, you know. <laughs> right and he's not giving you all the permission to pet him if you see him <laughs> little oh, Claire <laughs> yeah. well thank you Roque for talking to our community about ability advocacy and closing our third season we thank you for talking to us about the importance of ability advocacy and things our community needs to consider we look forward to witnessing your journey unfold and supporting your work and advocacy in the process. Maraming salamat in your lahat. I really appreciate the opportunity, Cheryl, to speak on about disabilities, and I really do uh, appreciate the work. Congrats on the uh, three seasons, and uh, props to the team that uh, put this podcast together. And thank you to all the listeners and supporters. I uh, really appreciate you all. Salamat. And to our community, our first episode of season four, we're bringing that dragon energy as we talk about healing from sexual trauma with licensed marriage and family therapist Emerald Rubio. 
This episode will air on Wellness Wednesday, April 17th. As we close, we'd like to acknowledge once again our guest speaker, Roque Bukton, our graphic designer and beat maker for our opening and closing track, Richie, Jinji for consent to use the first part of your instrumental track, Instinctual Time Travels, that you heard during our break, our advisors, Alison De La Cruz, Rian De Los Reyes, and Safo Teologo, our community partners, this Filipino American Life, SoCal Filipinos, and Trek Table, and all of our community members for your shares and support. As always, we'll share more about our guest speakers' offerings on our Instagram stories and highlights for permanent access with any of their upcoming events. Be sure to follow us at Philippine X in Wellness on Instagram, Threads, Facebook, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. And on X at Philippine X, the letter N, well, followed by the letters N and S. Don't forget to continue to hit like and subscribe on our Philippine X in Wellness YouTube channel. Thank you always for believing in us. Be well, everyone. Continue to take care of yourselves and each other as I continue to take care of this cold. Daghang salamat, salamat yin. Thank you.